The Gospel According to St. John, Chapter 15 I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He takes away every branch that does not bear fruit in me. He prunes every branch that bears fruit, that it will bear more fruit. You are clean already because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it remains in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit because apart from me you could accomplish nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown out like a branch and dries up. Such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire and burnt. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My Father is honoured by this, that you bear much fruit, and show that you are my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Remain in my love. If you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be complete. My commandment is this, to love one another just as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, that one lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I no longer call you slaves because the slave does not understand what his master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have revealed to you everything I heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that remains, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give to you. This I command you, to love one another. If the world hates you, be aware that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you do not belong to the world, but I chose you out of the world, for this reason the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they obeyed my world, they would obey yours too. But they will do all these things to you on account of my name, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But they no longer have any excuse for their sin. The one who hates me hates my father too. If I had not performed among them the miraculous deeds that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen the deeds and have hated both me and my father. Now this happened to fulfil the word that is written in their law. They hated me without reason. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send you from the father, the Spirit of Truth who goes out from the Father. He will testify about me, and you also will testify, because you have been with me from the beginning. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Like a friend who cannot tear himself away, and has many more last words, after he has bid us goodbye. Jesus continued to speak to the disciples while they are selecting and putting on their sandals and girding themselves to face the chill night air. He had to all appearances said what he had meant to say. 
He had indeed closed the conversation with those melancholy words. Henceforth I will not talk much with you. He had given the signal for breaking up the feast and leaving the house, rising from the table himself and summoning the rest to do the same. But as he saw their reluctance to move and the alarmed and bewildered expressions that hung upon their faces, he could but not renew his efforts to banish their foreboding and impart them to intelligent courage to face separation from him. All he had said about his spiritual presence with them had fallen short. They had failed to understand it. They were possessed with the dread of losing him whose future was their future, and with the success of whose plans all their hopes were bound up. The prospect of losing him was too dreadful, and though he had assured them he would still be with them, there was some appearance of mystery and unreality about that presence which prevented them from completely trusting it. He knew that they could do nothing if he left them. Their work was done, their hopes blighted. As Jesus then rises from the table and they all fondly gather around him, as he recognises once more how much he is to these men, there occurs to his mind an allegory which may help the disciples to understand better the connection they have with him and how it might still be maintained. It has been supposed that this allegory was suggested to him by some vine trailing around at the doorway or by some other visible object. But such a suggestion is needless. Recognising their fears and difficulties and their dependence on him as they hang upon him for the last time. What more natural than he should meet their dependence and remove their fears of real separation, saying, I am the vine and you are the branches. What more natural when he wished to set vividly before them the importance of the work he was giving to them, and to stimulate them faithfully to carry on what he had begun, than to say, I am the vine and you are the fruit-bearing branches. Abide in me, and I in you. Doubtless our Lord's, our Lord's introduction of the word true, or real, I am the true vine, suggests a comparison with other vines, but not necessarily with any vines then outwardly visible. Much more likely, is that as he saw the dependence of his disciples upon him, he saw new meaning in the old and familiar idea that Israel was the vine planted by God. He saw that in himself and his disciples all that had been suggested by this figure was in reality accomplished. God's intention in creating man had been fulfilled. It was secured by the life of Christ and by the attachment of men to him, that the purpose of God in creation would bear fruit. That which amply satisfied God was now in actual existence in the person of Christ. Seizing upon the figure of the vine as fully expressing this, Christ fixes it forever in the mind of his disciples as the symbol of his connection with them. And with a few decisive strokes, he gives prominence to the chief characteristics of this connection. The first idea, then, which our Lord wished to present by means of this allegory is that he and his disciples together form one whole, neither being complete without the other. The vine can bear no fruit if it has no branches. The branches cannot live apart from the vine. Without the branches, the stem is a fruitless pole. Without the stem, the branches wither and die. Stem and branches together constitute one fruit-bearing tree. I, for my part, says Christ, am the vine. You are the branches, neither perfect without the other. 
the two together forming one complete tree, essential to one as ste another as stem and branches. The significance underlying this figure is obvious, and no more welcome or animating thought could have reached the heart of his disciples as they felt the first tremors of separation from their Lord. Christ, in his own visible person and by his own hands and words, was no longer to extend his kingdom on earth. He was to continue to fulfil God's purpose among men, no longer, however, in his own person, but through his disciples. They were now to be his branches, the medium through which he could express all the life that was in him his love for man, his purpose to lift and to save the world. Not with his own lips was he any longer to tell men of the holiness and of God. Not with his own hand was he to dispense blessing to the needy ones on earth. But his disciples were now to be the sympathetic interpreters of his goodness and the unobstructive channels through which he might still pour out upon men his loving purpose. As God the Father is a spirit and needs human hands to do actual deeds of mercy for him, as he does not himself in his own separate personality make the bed of the poor, but it does only through the intervention of human charity. In the same way Christ can speak no more audible word in the ear of the sinner nor do the actual work required for the help and advancement of mankind. This he leaves to his disciples, his human agents. His part is to give them love and perseverance for it, to supply them with all they need as his branches. This, then, is the last word of encouragement and of quickening that our Lord leaves with these men and also with us. I leave you to do all for me. I entrust you with this gravest of tasks in accomplishing in the world all I have prepared for by my life and death. This great end to attend which I thought fit to leave the glory I had with my father and for which I have spent all. This I leave in your hands. It is in this world of men the whole results of the incarnation are to be found. It is upon you the burden is laid of applying to the world the work I have done. You live for me, but on the other hand I also live for you. Because I live, you also shall live. I do not really leave you. If I say, abide in me, I nonetheless say, and I in you. It is in you that I spend all the divine energy you have witnessed in my life. It is through you that I live. I am the vine, the life-giving stem, sustaining and quickening you. You are the branches, giving effect to my intentions, bearing the fruit for the sake of which I have been planted in the world by my father, the gardener. The second idea is that this unity of the tree is formed by the unity of life. It is a unity brought about not by mechanical juxtaposition, but by organic relationship. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, but must abide in the vine, so neither can you accept or abide in me. A ball of twine or a bag of shot cannot be called a whole. If you cut off a yard of the twine, the part cut off has the qualities and properties of the remainder and it is perhaps more serviceable apart from the rest in connection with it. A handful of shot is more serviceable for any purpose than a bagful, and the quantity you take out of the bag retains the properties it had while in the bag, because there is no common life in the twine or in the shot, making the particles one whole. But take anything which is the true unity or whole, your body, for example, Different results follow here from separation. Your eye is useless when taken from its place in the body. You can lend a friend your knife or your purse, and it may be more serviceable in your hands than in yours, 
but you cannot lend him your arm or your leg. For apart from yourself, the members of your body are useless, because here there is one common life, forming one organic whole. And so it is in the relation between Christ and his followers. He and they together form one whole, because one common life unites them. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, so neither can you. Why then can the branch bear no fruit, except that it lives in the vine? Because it is a unity that makes the tree one. And what is a vital unity between persons? It can be nothing else than a spiritual unity. A unity not of a bodily kind, but an inward and but is inward and of the spirit. In other words, it is a unity of purpose and of resources for attaining that purpose. The branch is one with the tree because it draws its life from the tree and bears the fruit appropriate to the tree. We are one with Christ when we adopt his purpose in the world as the real governing aim of our life, when we renew our strength for the fulfilment of that purpose by fellowship with his love for mankind and his eternal purpose to bless men. We must be content then to be branches. We must be content not to stand isolated and grow from a private root of our own. We must utterly renounce selfishness. Successful selfishness is absolutely impossible. The greater the apparent success of selfishness is, the more gigantic will be the failure one day. An arm is severed from the body, a branch cut from the tree, is the true symbol of a selfish man. He will be left behind as the true progress of mankind proceeds further, with no part in the common joy, stranded and dying on the ground in cold isolation. We must learn that our true life can only be lived when we recognise that we are part of a great whole that we are here not to prosecute any private interest of our own and win a private good for ourselves, but to go forward the good that is others that others share in and the cause that is in common. How this unity is formed received no explanation on this occasion. The manner in which men became branches of the true vine was not touched upon in the allegory. Already the disciples were branches and no explanation was called for. It may, however, be appropriate to gather a hint from the allegory itself regarding the formation of a living bond between Christ and his people. However ignorant we may be of the propagation of fruit trees and of the process of grafting, we can at any rate understand that no mere tying of a branch to a tree bark to bark would affect anything except the death of the branch. The branch, if it is to be fruitful, must form a solid part of the tree and must therefore be grafted so as to become of one structure and life with the stem. It must be cut through so as to lay bare the whole interior structure of it and so as to leave open all the vessels that carry the sap. And a similar incision should be made in the stock upon which the branch is to be grafted, so that the cut sap, vessels of the branch, may be in contact with the cup sap vessels of the stock. Such must be our grafting into Christ. It must be the laying bare of our inmost nature to his inmost nature, so that a common and essential connection may be formed between the two. What we expect to receive by being connected with Christ is the very spirit which made him what he was. We expect to receive into the source of conduct in us all that was the source of conduct in him. We wish to be in such a connection with him that his principles, sentiments and aims shall become ours. On his side, Christ has laid bare his deepest feelings and spirit. In his life and in his death, he submitted to that severest operation 
which seemed to be a maiming of him, but which in point of fact was the necessary preparation for his receiving fruitful branches. He did not hide the true springs of his life under a hard and rough bark, but submitted himself to the gardener's knife. He suffered for us through his wounds to see the real motives and vital spirits of his nature, truth, justice, holiness, fidelity and love. Whatever in this life cut our Lord to the quick, whatever tested most thoroughly the true spring of his conduct, only more clearly showed that deepest within him and strongest within him lay holy love. He was not shy of telling men his love for them. In the public death he died loudly declaring it, opening his nature to the gaze of all. To this open heart he declined to receive none. As many as the Father gave him were welcome. He had none of that aversion we often admit to, and sundry into close relations with us. He at once gives his heart and keeps back nothing to himself. He invites us into the closest possible connection with him, with the intention that we should grow to him and be forever loved by him. Whatever real, lasting and influential connection can be established between two persons, this he wishes to have with us. If it is possible for two persons so to grow together that separation in spirit is forever impossible, it is nothing short of this that Christ seeks. But when we return to the cutting of the branch, we see reluctance and vacillation and much to remind us that, in the graft we now speak of, the gardener has to deal not with passage branches, which cannot shrink from his knife, but with free and sensitive human beings. The hand of the Father is on us to sever us from the old stock and give us a place in Christ. But we find it hard to be severed from the root that we have grown up from, and to which we are now so firmly attached. We refuse to see that the old tree is doomed to the axe, or that we have been inserted into Christ, we loosen ourselves again and again, so that morning by morning as the Father visits his tree, he finds us dangling further and further, useless, with signs of withering already upon us. But in the end, the vine dresser's patient skill prevails. We submit ourselves to those incisive operations of God's providence or of his gentler but effective word, which finally sever us from that which we so desperately clung to. We are impelled to lay our heart to Christ and seek the deepest, truest and most influential union. Even after the graft has been achieved, the husbandman's care is needed for the branch to abide in the vine, that it may bring forth more fruit. There are risks. The branch may be loosened, or it may just run to wood and leaves. Care is taken when the graft is made to ensure its permanent participation in the life of the tree to be secured. The graft is not only tied to the tree, but the point of puncture, the joint, is cased in clay, pitch or wax, so to exclude air, water or any other disturbing influence. A similar spiritual treatment is certainly necessary if the attachment of the soul to Christ is to become solid, firm and permanent. If the soul and Christ are really to be one, nothing must be allowed to tamper with the attachment. It must be sheltered from all that might rudely impinge upon it, displacing the disciple from the attitude toward Christ that he has assumed and which is so necessary. When the graft and the stock have grown together into one, then the point of attachment will resist any shock. But while the attachment is recent, care is needed that the juncture be hermetically secluded and sealed. 
from adverse influences. The gardener's care is also needed so that after the branch is grafted it may bring forth fruit abundantly. Stagnation is not to be tolerated. As for fruitlessness, that is out of the question. More fruit each season is earnestly looked for and arranged for by the vigorous pruning of the husbandman. The branch is not left to nature, neither is it allowed to run out in every direction, to waste its life in attaining size. Where it seems to be doing grandly and promising success, the knife of the vine dresser ruthlessly cuts down the flourish, and the fine appearance lies withering on the grid. But the vintage justifies the husbandman. This brings us to the third idea of the allegory, that the result aimed for in our connection with Christ is bearing fruit. The allegory bids us think of God as engaged in the painstakingly meticulous nurturing and culturing of men, with the watchful fond interest with which the vine dresser tends his plants through every stage of growth and every season of the year. Even when there is nothing done, he gazes upon them admiringly and still finds some little attention he can pay them. But all in the hope of fruit. All his interest collapses at once. All his care becomes a foolish waste of time and material and reflects discredit and ridicule on the vine dresser if there is no fruit. God has prepared for us in this life a soil in which nothing can be better for the production of the fruit he desires us to yield. He has made it possible for every man to serve a good purpose. He does his part, not with reluctance, but, if we might say so, as his chief interest, but all in the expectation of fruit. We do not spend days of labour and nights of anxious thought. We do not lay out all that we have at his command. On that which is to effect nothing and give no satisfaction to ourselves or anyone else. And neither does God. He does not make this world full of men for the want of something better to do, as a mere idle pastime. He made it so that the earth might yield her increase, that each of us might bring forth fruit. Fruit alone can justify the expense and effort put into this world. The wisdom, the patience, the love that we have guided all things through the slow-moving ages will be justified in the final product. What this product is, we already know. It is the attainment of moral perfection by created beings. To this, all that has been made and done in the past leads. The whole creation groans and works. But for what? For the manifestation of the sons of God. The life and acts of good men are the adequate return for all that capital outlay, the satisfying fruit. The production of this fruit become, it became a certainty when Christ was planted in the world as the new moral stem. He was sent into the world not to make some magnificent outward display of divine power, to carry us to some other planet, or to alter the conditions of life here. God might have departed from his purpose of filling this earth with holy men, and might have used it for some easier display for which the moment might have seemed more striking. But he did not choose to do so. It was human obedience, the fruit of genuine human righteousness, of the love and goodness of men and women, that he was resolved to reap from the earth. He was resolved to train men to such a pitch of goodness that in a world contrived to tempt there should be found nothing so alluring, nothing so terrifying as to turn men from the straight path. He was to produce a race of men who, while still in the body, urged by appetite, assaulted by passions and cravings with death threatening and life inviting, should prefer all suffering rather than flinch from duty, 
should prove themselves actually superior to every assault that could be made on virtue, should prove that spirit is greater than matter. And God set Christ in the world to be the living type of human perfection, to attract men by their love for him and his kind of life, to furnish them with all needed aid in becoming like him, that as Christ had kept the Father's commandments, his disciples also should keep his commandments that thus a common understanding, an identity of interest and moral life, should be established between God and man. Perhaps it is not pressing the figure too hard to remark that the fruit differs from timber in this respect, that it enters into and nourishes the life of man. No doubt in this allegory, fruit-bearing primarily and chiefly indicates God's purpose in creating man, being satisfied. The tree he has planted is not barren but fruitful, but certainly a great distinction between the selfish and the unselfish, between the man who has private ambition and the man who labours for the good of the public, lies in this, that the selfish man seeks to erect a monument of some kind for himself, while the unselfish man spends himself in labours that are not conspicuous, but assist the life of his fellows. An oak carving or a structure of hard wood will last a thousand years and keep in memory the skill of the designer. Fruit is eaten and disappears, but it passes and becomes human life. It becomes part of the stream that flows on for ever. The ambitious man longs to execute a monumental work and does not much regard whether it will be for the good of men or not. A great war will serve his turn, a great book, anything conspicuous. But he who is content to be a branch of the true vine will not seek the admiration of man, but will strive to introduce a healthy spiritual life into those he can reach, All, even though, in order to do so, he must remain obscure and see his labours absorbed without notice or the least recognition. Does the teaching of this allegory, then, accord with the facts of life as we might know them? Is it a truth, a truth we must act upon, that apart from Christ we can do nothing? In what sense and to what extent is association with Christ really necessary for us? Something may, of course, be made for life apart from Christ. A man might have much enjoyment, and a man might do much good apart from Christ. He may be an inventor who makes human life easier, or safer, or more full of interest. He may be a literary man who by his writings enlightens, accelerates and elevates mankind. He might, with an entire ignorance or disregard of Christ, toil for his country, or for his class, or for his cause. But the best uses and ends of human life cannot be attained apart from Christ. Only in him does the reunion of man with God seem attainable, and only in him do God and God's aim and work in the world become intelligible. He is as necessary for the spiritual life of men as the sun is for this physical life. We may affect something by candlelight, we may be quite proud of electric light and think we are getting far towards independence. But what man in his senses will be betrayed by these attainments into thinking we might dispense with the sun? Christ holds the key to all that is most permanent in human endeavour, to all that is deepest and best in human character. Only in him can we take our place as partners with God. In what? He is really doing with this world. Only from him can we draw courage, hope, love, sufficient to prosecute this work. In him God does reveal himself, and in him the fullness of God is found by us. He is, in point of fact, the one moral stem, apart from whom we are neither bearing nor cannot bear the fruit God desires we bear. If, then, 
we are not bringing forth fruit. It is because there is a flaw in our connection with Christ. If we are conscious that the results of our life and activity are not such results as he might design, and are in no sense traceable to him, this is because there is something about our adherence to him that is loose and needs repair. Christ calls us to him and makes us sharers in his work. He who listens to this call and counts it enough to be a branch of the vine and to do his will is upheld by Christ's spirit, is sweetened by his meekness and love, is purified by his holy and fearless rectitude, transformed by the dominant will of this person whom he has received deepest into his soul and therefore brings forth in whatever place in life he holds the same fruit as Christ himself had brought forth before. It is indeed Christ who brings forth these fruits. Christ as a few steps removed, for every Christian learns as well as Paul to say, Not I, but Christ within me. If then the will of Christ is not fulfilled through us, if there is good that it belongs to do, to us to do, but which remains undone, then that point of juncture with Christ is the point that needs repair. It is not some unaccountable blight that makes us useless. It is not that we have got the wrong piece of the wall, a situation in which Christ himself could bear no precious fruit. The husbandman knows his own meaning when he trained us along that restricted line and nailed us down. He chose the place for us, knowing the quality of fruit he wants to yield. The reason for our fruitlessness is simple, that we are not closely enough attached to the root. How then is it with ourselves? By examining the results of our lives, would anyone be prompted to exclaim, These are trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. This examination is made and not made by one who chances to pass, and who being a novice in horticulture might be deceived by a show of leaves, or whose examination might wonder at the slothfulness or mismanagement of the owner who allowed such trees to cumber his ground. But the examination is made by the one who has come for the express purpose of collecting his fruit. He knows exactly what has been spent on us, and what might have been made of our opportunities, who has in his own mind a definite idea of the fruit that should be found, who can tell by a glance whether such fruit exists or not. To this infallible judge of produce, what have I to offer? From all my busy engagement in my many different affairs, from all my thought, what has resulted that I might offer as a satisfactory return for all that has been spent upon me? It is deeds of profitable service that, as men of large and loving nature, would do that God seeks from us. He recognises without fail what is love, and what only seems to be love. He infallibly detects the corroding pot of selfishness that rots the whole fair-seeming cluster. He cannot be deceived before us, and partakes our lives precisely for what they are worth. It is necessary for us to make such inquiries, for fruitless branches cannot be tolerated. The purpose of the tree is fruit. If then we would escape all suspicion of our own state, of all reproach of fruitlessness, what we have to do is not so much find out new rules for our conduct, as to strive to renew our hold upon Christ and intelligently enter into his purpose. Abide in him. This is the secret of fruitfulness. 
All that the branch needs is in the vine. It does not need to go beyond the vine for anything. When we feel the life of Christ ebbing away from our soul, when we see our leaf fading, when we feel sapless and dry, heartless for Christian duty, reluctant to work for others, reluctant to take anything to do with the relief of misery and the repression of vice. There is a remedy for this state. It is to renew our fellowship with Christ, to allow the mind once more to conceive clearly the worthiness of his aims, to yield the heart once again to the vitalizing influence of his love to turn from the vanities and futilities with which men strive to make life seem important to the reality and substance of the life of Christ. To abide in Christ is to abide by our adoption of his view of the true purpose of human life, after testing it by actual experience. It is to abide in our trust in him as the true Lord of men, and as to as able to supply us with all that we need to keep his commandments. And so abiding in Christ, we are always sustained by him, for he abides in us, imparts to us his branches now on earth, the force which is needful to accomplish his purpose. <laughs>